Today, Rochester's sister cities. President Eisenhower initiated the sister cities program in 1956 to encourage Americans to communicate with people around the globe on mutually beneficial projects to bring about world peace. And Rochester, New York was among the very first cities to uh, begin the sister cities program locally. And here to talk about it today is a panel of folks from the International Sister Cities of Rochester. I'm going to introduce City Councilwoman Carolee Conklin, and then she will introduce the panel. Uh, Carolee, you probably know as City Councilwoman, she's the president of the International Sister Cities of Rochester, and on council also chairs the Finance Committee, and is a member of the Neighborhood and Business Development Committee and the Employment and Economic Development Committee. So a very busy woman, and we're delighted to have her leading this team today. So thank you, and uh, I'll introduce Carolee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is one of my favorite spots downtown. It's uh, what I call my neighborhood library. I live right across the river uh, in Corn Hill. So that I spend quite a bit of time in this library. Um, it's it's a wonderful institution for the community, for the for the the county of Monroe as a whole. So um, and obviously, I think everybody here probably feels the way I do about this library. So let's talk a little bit about sister cities. Uh, it was in fact begun by um, Dwight Eisenhower in 1956. Uh, Rochester got into um, the sister city program very, very early in the game. Our first sister city, Wren, was established in 1958. Um, our, our mayor, our council member, then Mayor Frank Lamb, uh, spent about 50 years actively involved in sister cities. Uh, he, uh, after his retirement, uh, he worked tirelessly for sister city. So uh, it's a program that really stretches around the world, and it's a program that relies on citizen diplomacy. So our panel we put together today, um, other than four of us, we could probably do a barbershop quartet, but um, no, no, Dan says no. So let me just spend a moment introducing who we've got talking to you today. Uh, first is Mike Leach. Mike Leach retired two years ago from the uh, city engineering, but for many, many years, he's been an active volunteer in Sister Cities. He's the chair of our Krakow Committee. Uh, we're very fortunate that he is our post-retirement staff person for Sister City. He works directly with the mayor's office and with the Sister City Board. Next to him, the charming little leprechaun in the, with the white hair. Ma many of you from the library probably remember Kevin. Um, my relationship with Kevin goes back even further. Uh, we've been longtime friends. He's on the board of uh, International Sister Cities and um, uh, an active Irish person. Uh, then we have Dan Karen. You notice the theme here is retired, retired, retired. So our next person is Dan Karen, who retired a year ago as the city clerk of Rochester, has been involved in Sister Cities for a number of years. He is the chair of our Israeli Sister City, uh, Rehovot, which is um, not a terribly old city, but uh, a new and vibrant city in Israel. So that makes up the four of us, and rather than one person droning on, we're gonna split up the um, information sharing. We will have a constant loop going on of different sister cities and visits there. So without further ado, um, I would now Dan, Dan, come on up. Um, Dan, Karen, everybody, welcome. Thank, thank you very much. I also am a big fan of, uh, of libraries. For almost about a year now since I retired, I've been volunteering uh, for the foundation, and I work with a, with a great bunch of, uh, of other volunteers. Um, my, my job at first is to talk again about Dwight Eisenhower's, how he began the, um, 
th this program. Uh, again, for the third time you're hearing this now, he began in 1956. Um, he, he, as you probably all know, was a five-star general uh, in World War II, uh, was the, uh, the Allied commander in Europe. And because of that position, he saw a lot of death and destruction. For, for him, war was not a blockbuster Hollywood movie. It was real. It was ugly. And as president, he, he tried to find ways to have it not happen again. And in 1956, he called together a conference in Washington, invited about 100 uh, national leaders, and they looked for ways to try to find a solution, a long-term solution to war. And what they came up with was a program to become sister cities um, that involved people, ordinary people in different countries reaching out to other ordinary people across the ocean, across the, the political boundary, uh, to get to know each other uh, with, with the understanding that the, the more they knew about each other, uh, the more people across different lands knew about each other, the less likely there would be, would be war. Um, and that first, that first um, uh, conference in 1956 included such leaders as um, comedian Bob Hope and Walt Disney. And as sort of an aside, uh, that, that I don't know how many of you have been at Disney World and Disneyland, but the, the It's a Small World um, theme that they have there in one of their amusement attractions uh, got its inspiration from the Sister Cities uh, initiative in the mid-50s. And I'll also point out, uh, in, case you, in case you ever go with children or grandchildren, there's not much of a line at that one. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm a big fan of the theme. Am I introducing Mike? Is Mike the next speaker? A little, little housekeeping detail here. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Mike Leach, who, as you know, has been active in sister cities for many years. Uh, like me, a former a city retiree, and uh, has probably given more of his time uh, than any other people that I know of, maybe with the exception of a couple. He's been really good and taking help take care of a lot of the details to make this stuff work. Mike? Well, actually, it got started earlier than 1956. Mayor Henri Faville of Rennes, France, uh, came to Rochester. I don't know why he chose Rochester, but I thank him. He wanted to establish a connection with one of the cities where uh, people who had liberated Rennes during World War II came from. And it, uh, we had the 1956 conference, and we had this. It seems that our mayor, Peter Berry, wanted to learn French before he traveled to the potential sister city. He wanted to speak to them in their own language. So in 1956, in 1958, that connection occurred. But Rochester, through Frank Lamb in particular, has been active over the years in promoting it. Frank Lamb was instrumental in getting the Tempe, Arizona, where he retired to, program going. We've advised many different uh, communities on what things can be successful and what mistakes to avoid. We have great experience. The process for creating a sister city relationship really varies from community to community. For some, it's ceremonial, and not a lot happens thereafter. Without criticizing, we have an opportunity with Monroe County. They have a, a sister county connection with Cavan in uh, Ireland, the home of uh, Patrick O'Rourke, after whom the bridge is named. Some of us are looking in, how can we make this a little more lively and a little more concrete? But that relationship is an example of a ceremonial relationship, one that people are proud of, and that's as far as it goes. Others try to make the uh, relationships productive for their communities. And sometimes that's very hard. Some say, well, let's, let's get married and see what happens. And some say, well, let's think this out and uh, see whether it really will be productive for both communities and really do some planning, almost a business plan, to see how will this relationship benefit both communities mutually. And if it doesn't seem to, they won't enter that relationship because we don't want to cost either ourselves or that 
potential partner city a good productive relationship with another community in the United States. Rochester has examples of both types of relationships. And as we go through them, we'll see. For example, our relationship with Caltanissetta, Italy, really the heart of it is that's where the, uh, most of the Italian community came from. There's a great love for that. But the activities going on, well, we wish they could be more. Or the activities change over time. Something might get going and be going strong for five, 10, maybe 15 years, but then it drops off. So the Rochester process, the one we're really pursuing now, is trying to do the advanced work to make sure we have people in this community who are dedicated to making the relationship work. Uh, not just necessarily from a single interest group, an eth ethnic community or a sports group, but from a broad cross-section of our community so that our community is really learning and that the community abroad can learn about the breadth of our community. That gives us more opportunity for productive exchanges. So it can be a long process. It might take two, three, four years before something really works out, before we make the institutional connections, before we find out how will we fund the activities we undertake and will those activities last over time or if they don't, are there opportunities for other activities? Getting too long-winded here. We now have 12 sister cities. Some are very active, some are some have a lot of potential. <laughs> uh, you can find out more about us. We have a uh, Facebook page. We have a, uh, two websites, one on the city of Rochester that gives very detailed information about it, uh, the sister city basic stuff, and one called rochestersistercities.org that gives a lot uh, more detailed information about activities. You can find the uh, the website address on the brochures that are on the table at the back. Um, who shall we start with for the different sister cities? You know, um, thank you, Mike. Um, I've been really blessed to be a member of the uh, Sister Cities Board for 10 or 15 years, and I have Lois Geist to thank for that. She asked me one day, hey, do you want to be a member of the Sister Cities? And I said, sure. And it's been a really fantastic experience. And, and from my end, um, I'm going to talk about three sister cities, Waterford, Bamako, and Alutas. Um, that's the ones that are given to me. And, for, and basically, what I want to talk about is that you, you kind of, uh, when you're on the board and you start to do the citizen diplomacy, you sort of get a little bit out of your comfort zone. But there's all these aha moments that sort of hit when you meet these different people from different parts of the world. And so uh, one of my first meetings, of course, was, uh, and I was very fortunate, was I had a day to spend with the uh, mayor of Waterford and his entourage. And so it was a Sunday, and so what do you do when you're Irish first thing on a Sunday morning? St. Mary's Church, that's where we were. And, uh, and then after Mass, there was a whole schedule of things that we had to go to. The final one, if we had time before he was gonna throw the ball out at the Red Wings game, was to go to Johnny's Irish Pub. And so as the day progressed, you know how Irishmen are. I bet this is going to be a 15-hour discussion now. No, I mean, but, any, but anyway, the Irishmen tend to talk a long time and do a lot of different things. So we went to a bunch of different sites in the city. We were going to Strong Museum, which is supposed to be an hour and a half. And uh, the mayor said, um, aren't we supposed to go to Johnny's Irish Pub? And I said, well, yeah. And I said, but, you know, we may not be able to make it. He said, well, what we tell people is we have another engagement. Teaching me a little bit of politics here. And so what they wanted to see was the Butterfly Museum. We went there, and then he said, you know, we have another engagement. So we had to go to Johnny's Irish Pub. And they had a group of Irish um, band pe pe people playing there with their music, which was really cool. But um, the other thing is there's certain miracles that happen when you're Irish. I walked in. I looked at one of the Irish entourage. They looked at me and looked down, and there was a Guinness. Oh, it was wonderful. And that's one of the benefits for a board, okay? But then what happened was they played the music and the Guinness was gone and another one looked and it came back. And so I'm saying, there's some miracles there that happen, you know? So that was one of, the, one of the experiences that you have when you're on one of these boards. It's just a lot of fun. And then also talking about the country and things like that. There are delegations that go back and forth, you know? The second experience that I had that I thought was really pretty phenomenal was 
um, I don't know, we were in City Hall, I was talking to Mike, and um, the uh, ambassador to, uh, from Mali had come up from uh, DC to um, see two students from Mali, from Bamako, who were at RIT studying engineering. And basically, um, he wanted to make sure that they were gonna come back to Bamako. But the thing was meeting this guy. He was about six foot 10. And, I, and it was also, uh, he spoke French was uh, one of his languages. Um, he also spoke English, but very, very distinguished. And, but it was an aha moment we were saying, wow, um, here's a country. They've got two people going to RIT to be engineers, and this guy is coming up from DC to just to make sure he's coming back. You know, which kind of says, huh, it gives you a whole different idea of um, what's going on with different parts of the world, you know. And then the final, um, the final city, sister city I was going to talk about is Eleutis. And uh, this, is, uh, it's, this is one of our more recent sister cities. It's in Li Lithuania. And uh, this, uh, uh, <coughs> the guy that runs it, his name is Remus Chisonis. And he's the father of uh, uh, Arunas, who uh, started up Paytech. And, uh, but he's a really interesting guy. And... Um, but one of the things that uh, uh, occurred here at Steps Back, I used to work at the library, and um, this is how you get this citizen diplomacy working. Um, I used to work at the library, and they had this Dravikas fund. There was a guy in my neighborhood, he was a librarian, but he also renovated a lot of houses, and he had a pile of money, and uh, he didn't, you know, he died. But he left this money for, um, to the library to have a, a Lithuanian collection at the library. And so this was in the late 80s, early 90s, and the librarian said, what are we going to do with a Lithuanian collection? They had no idea. Now, I had an idea. Frank Zappa records. <laughs> he was a Lithuanian. But after the Frank Zappa records, then what? You know? But what happened was when I met Remus, he said, wow, we do need a, a, a Lithuanian collection. And he was the a person who was able to go back to Eleutis and then get these books. And then they came back to be part of the collection here. And there's been several uh, meetings with these guys uh, here. Um, with, uh, with the collection and discussion of the collection. I happen to be part of that too. So you get a real good sense of that. The other thing is you get a sense that Lithuania um, used to be a giant country with Poland and controlled most of Central Europe. And now they're a small country. In fact, they're, they're, um, they were conquered and now they're independent again. And they're very conscious of their independence and how fragile they are, especially during this time. And it's interesting getting some uh, comments from Mr. Chisonis about the Lithuanians, you know, which you know, we won't talk about here. We want to talk about positive stuff. And so uh, speaking about positive stuff, I'm going to pass the baton on to the next person. Who's, who's going to volunteer? Boom! <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, in, as they say, uh, he is a tough act to follow. Um, and I have three sister cities that I've been asked to share a few moments about. Uh, the first is Novgorod, Russia. And sitting here is Lois Geis. And uh, Lois and I were among a small delegation that in 1990 uh, visited the Soviet Union, which was, it was the Soviet Union then, to establish relationships with our very first Russian sister city, which is um, Novgorod, which lies just about um, 100 kilometers due south of what was then Leningrad. And um, we, uh, we were a little on the cautious side traveling to the Soviet Union, and uh, we <clears throat> ran a bus that took us from uh, Leningrad down to Novgorod, and as we're approaching, we can see that there's this crowd of people in the road, and they're waving signs, and we think, oh dear, are they here to protest against the Americans, or Amerikanskis, as they referred to us? Um, quite the contrary. There were probably 50 Russian people who were waving signs of welcome, American flags, Russian flags, and it was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, you know, I, I grew up in an age where you hid under the desk because you were afraid the Russians were going to bomb us with an atomic bomb. And uh, here, were, here were people who we found out were very much like we were, welcoming us into their homes, sharing what they had with us, and uh, that, that's sort of an example of what a sister city relationship is. Uh, the next um, uh, sister city I went to, the first delegation, was Xi'an, China, um, which is a large city. Well, it's a small city by uh, Chinese standards. It only has four million people in it. And um, so uh, that... Uh, that was, that was to me, um, 
you know, and here again, we form these impressions as children. I think mine was a Pearl Buck reading The Good Earth. And uh, it's a very, very industrial city, uh, well-educated people who place a huge priority on educating their children. Um, so it's, it's one more example of how your, how your eyes are opened as you travel the, road, the world. You see the, um, not only the differences in people, but the similarities. Um, then the last city I want to make a small reference to is Porta Plata, which is in the Dominican Republic. Um, it's a very poor third world country, um, high poverty, uh, a myriad of problems. And um, it's one of the best examples we have of a sister city involvement, um, sharing things with, with a sister city. Uh, they were, we had, there was a firefighter over in the public safety building who got interested in Porta Plata and their fire department. Um, they sponsored three or four firefighters from Porta Plata to put them through their training out on Scottsville Road. They were appalled at their equipment and uh, their abilities. So they decided they were going to take on a mission. Their mission was to collect what's referred to as surplus equipment uh, throughout Monroe County from volunteer firefighters to Monroe County and put together, was it 11, Mike? 10 tons. Hmm? 10 tons. 10 tons of fire equipment. Um, you know, our, our firefighters in Rochester, uh, their equipment, uh, when they're through with it, and they, because of federal regulations, have to replace it, still pretty good. So we sent, we collected, 10 tons of equipment, including an ambulance that Rural Metro donated. And now the next problem was, how are we going to get 10 tons of equipment? Well, Lee Johnson, a past president of ISCOR, did a little research and found that there's a wonderful program run by the US government that says, we've got a plane going that way and we've got room, we'll take it. And uh, we waited a while for a plane going that way. And then, I don't know how many of you know the size of a C-130. Uh, they're basically the size of a small battleship. Uh, they, they, I mean, literally, they fly tanks in them. So we had um, 10 tons of equipment that we got on a truck that was also donated, drove it to Niagara Falls, where the C-130 was loaded up, and, and now it's in Porta Plata. Now, the wonderful end to that story is the mayor of, and I'm not sure I got this story right, the mayor of our, of our sister city was involved in an automobile accident on the side of the road. The first one of the first runs of our donated ambulance was to take him to the hospital where he drink fine. So, um, we, we have all kinds of relationships, and one just sort of has a different one than another one does. But the one thing they all have in common is what you learn about another culture, what you learn about other people. So um, I, um, I think Mike is going to wrap up our sister, or Dan is going to, Mike and Dan are going to wrap up with Dan talking about Rehovit and Hamamatsu. Um, pretty different places, but um, Dan? And we're all, when we're done, we'll, uh, we'll yeah, try to be time to take questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, I, I chair, this yeah, I, I chair the Rehovit, the Rochester Sister Cities Committee. And um, like, like Rochester, there are many different kinds of people in, in Rehovit. Um, uh, they, they're, in modern times, the city was founded in 1890 uh, by, by Polish immigrants. Uh, they learned early on that, uh, that uh, irrigation was the way that they were going to grow citrus crops or anything. Uh, and over the years, um, emigres came in from uh, the, what was known as the Soviet Union. And um, more recently, in 1991, there was a very dramatic uh, airlift of, of Ethiopian Jews uh, to, uh, to Rehoboth. 
and other parts of Israel. Uh, Ethiopia in the early 90s was destabilizing as a country, and there was concern around, around the world what would happen to the, the fairly substantial Jewish population in Ethiopia. Uh, so for a very brief window, the government there allowed 35 uh, Israeli planes to airlift 14,000 Ethiopian Jews to Israel uh, in, uh, in about 36 hours. And uh, like in Rochester, there were settlement houses established in Israel and Rehoboth to welcome uh, newcomers and to teach them how to, to function in a new under a new language, a new culture. Um, and so what, some of the activities that have been undertaken by the uh, Sister Cities Committee here is we've undertaken fundraisers to send, um, to send books and backpacks to the children who are, who are in the Rehoboth um, settlement houses. Um, more recently, uh, as, as I was chair, uh, on two occasions, um, the Rehoboth Youth Orchestra uh, came to Rochester. There are about uh, 50, 50 young people, very, very talented. Um, and one of our challenges was, uh, they're, they're high school students, uh, a very talented bunch. And one of our challenges was to find, find housing, uh, private housing. So we, we, you know, you beat the bushes and we found a number of houses that would take one or two of the children and and as well as the conductor and the several uh, adult um, uh, traveling with them. And uh, they performed a couple of times in the Sister City Atrium uh, at Highland Bowl, one of, the, uh, one of the youth camps. And just a very, very talented bunch. And for many of them, when they, when they graduate from high school, uh, the next step is the Israeli military. Um, it's, it's quite, a, quite a, a, a sight to see these children perform in, in, uh, here in Rochester and experience some of the things that they have. And I'll tell you, kids, kids are kids. Uh, one of their favorite things to do, uh, both groups when they came, was to, uh, was to take a bus to the malls. They, <laughs> they, they, just, they just like that. Um, the other sister city I'm going to speak about is Hamamatsu, which was founded uh, thousands of years ago. It's about 100 miles uh, southeast of Tokyo. And um, they, they, uh, they have, like, like Rochester, they have very strong emphasis upon, upon music. And that's one of the ways that this relationship between Rochester and Hamamatsu started. The head of the, 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 head of the um, Eastman School of Music back in the early 90s uh, tr made a trip to Hamamatsu. Uh, there were some discussions about you know, forming some kind of a connection. And a connection was made with Hamamatsu in 1996. And for many years, the, 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 the back and forth between Rochester and uh, Hamamatsu related to music. One of their youth orchestras uh, performed here, and I think there's a, there's a slide behind me uh, that depicted uh, that performance here in Rochester. Um, there, there also, uh, more recently, um, there has been a, an important flower connection, because we are, of course, the flower cities, the flower city, and uh, back in the, uh, back in the late 90s, early, early 2000s, um, a, a member of the uh, uh, Iris Society named Edna Clonch decided it would be a nice idea to have a, a peace garden, international peace garden here in Rochester. So back and forth, back and forth, some, some lilies were, down, were donated uh, by, by volunteers and a, an international peace garden was created um, in 2004. I recall traveling with uh, then Council President Lois Geis to the, the park, in, uh, which is just in Highland Park, which is just um, south of the, uh, the reservoir, and we attended the, the groundbreaking for the, uh, for the Irish, Iris, I, Irish was it ready? The Irises um, uh, Garden, and uh, to this day, it's still there, and it's, it's been blooming, and blooming every spring, and there's thousands and thousands of, I, of irises. It's, it's quite lovely. Um, and, uh, they, some, of those, some of those irises were transported back to Hamamatsu uh, in a garden in, in, in Japan there. Um, Mike, you're next. Do you get the sense that our sister city relationships are based on whatever works and whatever's fun and whatever people like you and me can imagine and sustain? and finance. It's really people to people. Our connection with Ren France, the oldest one in our group, the core of its activities is between some French language classes, not in the city of Rochester, but in uh, the areas all around our community. Livonia, uh, Rush Henrietta, some Pittsford schools, 
we're, we draw on nearly five counties to make these things happen. And they have partnerships with uh, lycees, the high schools, in Wren. Now, all of their uh, wealthy population, prestigious schools, are within the city. You notice that ours are out in the suburbs. That uh, makes their visitors think. And I think it makes ours visit. Much different ways of uh, where the prestige is, where the poverty is. We learn about these little things while they're busy learning about language. That's been the core of it. They've had sports. They've had basketball teams go back and forth. And ours did good. Got more opportunities. Maybe we can get some business relationships going. We're working on that. Our Würzburg connection, and by the way, our chairman of the Würzburg committee, Dean Eckberg, is here. Who a lot of the things he's done is taken uh, choirs to Würzburg. But for many years, we had a uh, soccer team exchange. And like I said, the life of the committees, the activities levels, go up and down over the years. The uh, soccer teams can't travel back and forth anymore because of budgetary problems in uh, Germany, in, in Würzburg. But we're looking for other mischiefs. We're looking for other things that we can do, and we've got a long list of those things. Carlton Aceta has, although the long history and the long relationship between the people of our communities, the main relationship is a high school exchange, which has been going on for most of that uh, committee's 50-year life. And we are in the 50th year of that relationship. Uh, the last relationship that we have is uh, probably our fifth one with Krakow, Poland. When that started out in the 1970s, that was, I think, uh, the Sister Cities program's first connection between the Iron Curtain. And our program focused on education and humanitarian aid. Well, after the collapse of the communist governments, that city, which was for 500 years the capital of Poland, began revitalizing, really growing, telling Warsaw what it should do as the new capital of Poland. I mean, it's only been there as the new capital for 500 years. It really needs some advice. But our relationships are between the medical school at University of Rochester and uh, the Jagiellonian University with, uh, and also with their political science department. But they, want, they had a program last year, Krakow Days, they invited from their partner cities experts in graffiti control and graffiti art. So who did we send? One of our young artists, Sean Dunwoody, who uh, is an artist, leads an urban art program for our recreation department. And uh, well, I won't say anything about his controlling graffiti, but that urban art thing is to make a competitor to that. And he not only did his art there, it, a garbage plate to represent Rochester was his graffito. He observed to them, you know, graffiti control isn't all making the walls impervious or going in with an eraser defacer to get rid of the stuff. That's an opportunity for art on your bare walls. It's an opportunity to teach the kids how to do something constructive. He and a young woman, young artist from Sweden, made that point to all the people who were saying, how do we stop this? And when he presented it to our community, this young African-American artist told the uh, Polish Heritage Society, oh, by the way, I'm a graduate of the St. Stanislaus Polish School, elementary school which surprised his young students as much as it did our uh, Polish community people. Again, our program relies on what volunteers can do, what they can imagine, the resources they draw together. We try not to be too heavily reliant on city uh, taxes because we, when there's taxes expended, we want to make sure our community gets benefit value for that. 
So we host delegations. We'll give them a dinner, we'll give a reception. But really, the, the activity, the dynamism of our program really relies on people throughout the community and the resources they bring. The human resources, the financial, the imaginative resources. And I'll ask Carol Lee to uh, tell us more about that and wrap up the program. Thank you, Mike. Well, uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time in a few minutes, and uh, so I'll do a real quick wrap up. Uh, what we've attempted to do today is to give you a very brief overview of what Sister Cities is, um, a little bit about each of our Sister Cities. In the back, we have some brochures, some pamphlets that will give you the website information, the Facebook page, um, how, how do you get involved if you'd like to? Well, there's a number of ways. One is if you have a particular sister city that interests you, um, you can contact the, via email the, that sister city. You can um, let me know you're interested, you'd like more information. Um, it's, it's, it's a people-to-people -people effort, and that's what it depends on. It depends on people and volunteers has strong support from city government including the library which has been wonderful uh, they've hosted exhibits uh, they are hosting this today uh, they've been working with our sister city Würzburg for library exchanges so um, it's it's you know it's we, we throw some seeds out in a fertile field and hope they'll grow and bloom flowers and vegetables so if anybody has any questions, we'd love to answer them or attempt to answer them. Um, but we certainly appreciate you taking the time and um, joining us today. Thank you all. And uh, we'll be around here for a few minutes afterwards. If you have an additional question, we'd be glad to answer. Thank you very much.